Good morning, Bethel and family. Thank you for inviting us into your living rooms and your coffee tables or wherever you're viewing this this morning. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in, and as we are separated, this is a way we can come together and, and be together, even though it is virtually through online. I want to thank everyone for uh, supporting Bethel, for sending in their checks, and for tithing and choosing options like mailing them in or coming in and dropping them off at the church. Also, you can sign up for a direct deposit from your uh, bank account. I believe those forms will be on the website today. Uh, after the message, we have a, the chance that Leah came in and she recorded a children's message that she would normally be teaching during children's church. A link to that will be in, in the description below, as well as attached to the end of this video. So if you have young kids at home and want to uh, view that, that would be available for you today after this message. Uh, finally, if you have enjoyed these videos and feeling connected by the church, I'd encourage you to subscribe to this channel. It's something that we would plan to promote and put content on here even after we are back together. And if you subscribe, you will be notified when a new video is posted. Um, and we've been including videos midweek as well, a little midweek devotional. And you'll be notified when that is published as well. So please consider subscribing. And even if you like the video, uh, giving it a thumbs up to help promote in the YouTube and people searching to be able to view this as well. Again, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this message from Pastor Smith. Well, good morning, Bethel family. What a blessing it is to be able to discuss God's word with you this morning. I pray that our study together will be sweet to you. Pray that God would be glorified and honored as we, his people, gather around the warmth of his word. Pray that we're encouraged and strengthened by it. Uh, we're just so humbled by the technology that God has given us, the means in which he has provided uh, to serve, to serve you. Uh, various churches are doing things like this, as you well know, across uh, the country and we're thankful that we can do that as well with you this morning uh, before we open god's word let's let's pray and let's go to him and ask him to bless our time together father and our god we are very very thankful for the life that you have given the grace that you extend uh, the faith that you have gifted us with to believe in the lord jesus christ and to know him and to be known of him lord we would pray that uh, these next few moments together would bring glory to your name and your name alone Lord, would you be exalted uh, in, our, in our living rooms and uh, in front of our computers as we watch and listen and study your word. Uh, Lord, would all that, uh, again, bring you glory as we uh, truly pant for the water of your word. And we thank you that it promises to satisfy. We thank you that Isaiah tells us that your word will not return unto you void. So, Father, accomplish what only you can accomplish. Uh, Lord, would you completely, radically, upset the heart of an unbeliever that he or she might believe and uh, cause them to have faith. And Lord, for your children, Lord, would they be stirred in the inner man or inner woman, Lord, to serve you in a more profound way in a lost and dying world. Uh, Lord, again, all we say, do, and think this morning we want to do for your glory and for your honor. We love you. Please teach us to love you more and our neighbor as ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about... Um, or ask a question, I should say, and discuss Matthew 5, uh, part of uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, what's commonly referred to as Sermon on the Mount, and in particular, verses 13 through 16 in Matthew chapter 5. And I want to ask the question, how shall we now live? How shall we now live? I borrowed that title from a Chuck Colson, Nancy Piercy book uh, in 1999 of the same title, and that book discusses the various cultural aspects heading into Y2K, uh, dating myself, some of us remember that, and uh, the anxiety uh, that we had uh, regarding Y2K and what we thought uh, the year 2000 might bring. And uh, Colson and Piercy dialogue a lot and extensively in that book about how the Christian should respond in light of the things that we were fearful of. Well, Jesus, uh, in this section of Scripture, tells us some things that are pretty important for us to remember as believers, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says two things I really want to focus on. You are salt and you are light. Let me read the verses first and then we'll talk more about it. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. 
A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Needless to say, if you're like me, these last few weeks have really taken us by storm. It's shocked us. It's shake, shaken our foundation of what we believe life should be and what we thought life would be like. Uh, our current world is, is upset. Uh, we are, are stressed. Uh, some have maybe fallen even into depression and anxiety because we're just so uncertain of what the future is going to hold for us. And as we, as God's children, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want us to maybe think somewhat differently about what the Lord may be doing and saying to us during this crucial time in history. What is he saying to his church? What is he saying to us as individuals? What would he have us do? What would we have us be? We've had an opportunity to, to rest, for sure, uh, to reflect uh, with family and with friends, and to review, I pray, several areas of our individual lives, our family life, and we as a church family, as elders, we've even looked at how we do church. Us pastors have discussed uh, varying aspects of how church might be done differently in the future. So we've, we've had the opportunity to ask a lot of questions. And we've also considered, what is the churches, our individual, our families, what is our interaction like with the world at this point? Not much, right? We're, uh, we've got this, this limited interaction that we can have, this social distancing as it's, as it's called. I would submit to you that social distancing has always been there to some degree, maybe not in proximity of physical nature, but oftentimes in a, in a sharing kind of way, at least with the world. As believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, our interaction has been somewhat uh, different. Uh, but we uh, are really called to be something different as we live in this world. And I don't know about you, but what I've felt like I've faced and I've been able to do some self-reflection and look upon areas of my life that God has shown me over the past week, uh, that I have been very dependent upon this world and what it has to offer. Uh, what the world has now taken away, I couldn't believe how much I was dependent upon many of those things that I can no longer enjoy. And I pray myself, or I ask myself and pray, well, Lord, let's get back to normal. Will you, will you bring it back? And now I'm somewhat hesitant of that. Um, for many of us, uh, those who enjoy sports or college basketball, this would be March Madness time. We'd be glued to the television. Well, we're not, we're not there anymore. And, and I saw that those were one of the areas, at least entertainment, that I, I was dependent upon. Uh, maybe you have other things that have been taken away now that you that you been, begin to see that maybe those weren't things that I should have been so, so fixated on, so focused on. Remind you, I uh, believe we'll have it here on the screen for you, you don't have to turn your Bibles there to it, of what John says in his first letter. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. John goes on to say the world is passing away and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Our biblical worldview tells us that the world is corrupt and it's decaying, it's dark, and it's darkening. 2 Timothy 3.13 tells us that evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Despite that, Darkness, despite that deception, despite imposters and evil men, what are we called to do? What are we called to be? We are called, as Jesus says in John 17, to be in the world. He says these words in verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. That's us, brothers and sisters. For their sake, I sanctified myself that they may themselves also may be sanctified in truth. We are called as his ambassadors, as his children, to go into the world and interact with the world. Or in Matthew 5, we see that Jesus is now preaching his first sermon, his first public sermon. In the first few verses, we see what's commonly referred to as the Beatitudes, what we're called to be and what we're called to do in verses 3 through 12. 
Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one who is the prophesied one. Ma Matthew has spent uh, a lot of time in, verse, in chapters 1 and 2 in the birth narratives, as they were referred, discussing and dialoguing how Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. Chapter 3, we see his baptism. Chapter 4, we see his temptation. Now we see this Messiah is coming, and this Messiah has come, and he's going to tell us what we should do, how we should live as kingdom citizens. He's inaugurating something new. His kingdom will not be like what has transpired before, what they see, the people see in the Romans. It's going to be radically different than that. It's going to be marked by a people who inwardly look a lot different. We see there in verse 1 of chapter 5, Jesus saw the crowds and went up on the mountain. And after he had sat down, I guess I'm in good company this morning. I'm teaching sitting down. The disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. There's some discussion on who the them is. Is he talking to the multitudes or to his disciples? Well, the answer is yes. He's talking to both those. He's talking to the multitudes who are listening. But the primary audience, this primary uh, listener, the one who he wants to truly get this, it's his disciples, the 12 that he has chosen. And he's going to tell them about what kingdom life looks like. Jesus, as we know, his kingdom is not of this world. He, his kingdom is different than the Romans or, again, what's happened in history to this thus far. God's kingdom ambassadors and citizen, citizens are to live godly among those in the world. Those who have been drawn out by faith and who have embraced the Savior have different thinking. They have different interactions with the world. One commentator says, we see here a mandate for Christians to influence the world. The Beatitudes are not to be lived out in isolation or only amongst fellow believers, but everywhere we go. God's only witnesses are his children, and the world has no other way of knowing him except through the testimony of what we are. This Messiah, Jesus, ushers in a new way of thinking and living for kingdom citizens. He doesn't say that we remove ourselves from the world, but that we engage the world with the evidences that we are indeed kingdom citizens. Well, how are we to live in this world that is dark and dying and decaying and in some cases even hostile to us? Well, he tells us what we're to look like. Run through these verses really quick. He gives us some characteristics of what our attributes of what these kingdom citizens are going to look like. Verse 3, he says they're poor in spirit. Verse 4, those who mourn, the gentle in verse 5, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness in verse 6, the merciful in verse 7, the pure in heart in verse 8, and then finally the peacemakers in verse 9. But we don't stop there. It's not just those who are poor in spirit, more gentle, etc. that we just read. It's also those who are going to be insulted and persecuted, those who are going to have all kinds of evil spoken against them. It is these kingdom ambassadors, these men and women that will fulfill the calling that Christ has for all their lives to be what? Salt and light. How shall we now live? As kingdom citizens, we will live in such a way that brings him glory and displays what we are. First point, only two, as you can see in the text in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus says this word, it's an indicative, not an imperative. He doesn't say be salt. It's a statement of fact. You are salt. You are called out. You are different. You're not to be these things. As a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you observe these things as part of your nature, your new nature. You are Salt. Notice what he says here. Now, this is to a, Judaism, uh, a Jewish audience, an Israelite audience who would have really looked out for themselves. He says, you're the salt of the earth. Notice he doesn't say Jerusalem. He doesn't say any certain nation. He says the earth. Salt is a valuable product, and Jesus uses it, uh, a cultural norm that everyone would have been, had an understanding of and been familiar with, Jesus uses that as a metaphor for what believers are to be. Salt was considered a preservative. Christians are called to preserve, not the current culture, but this new culture to preserve ourselves and who we are, what Christ calls us to be and to make an impact on culture, to influence culture in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of social decay. 
We are called to be a purifying influence. We are called to be different. Needless to say, brothers and sisters, many around the world are, are stressed and struggling. Uh, they're not uh, quite clear about what's happening. Uh, they're not clear. Is, is this part of the end of the world narrative? There's all sorts of theories and ideas, all sorts of responses to those. Some hoard, some um, gather and garner to themselves weapons and alcohol and, yes, even toilet paper. All these different things, men and women gather to themselves, thinking that those things will somehow save. But we, brothers and sisters, we, I pray, have a calm assurance that our God is in the heavens and he does what he pleases, that he is in complete control. He is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He is Lord over all this. And we, as this preserving force, don't have to worry. We don't have to concern ourselves with the things of this world because we realize that this world is not our home. We are passing through. But we seek to maintain peace. We seek to give peace and discuss peace to make sure that the world sees something different, that they hear something different, that they see something different in our actions as we conduct ourselves in front of them. Let me read these verses for you in Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Conduct, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of your opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each one. This seasoning, this flavor, this enhancing should be done by, by Christians who have a new tongue. Uh, it's gracious speech. It's effective speech. Salt can often sting, but the words that we say should bring life, should be a balm, should be healing. It should prevent corruption. Our speech should act as a purifying influence, one commentator says. We should rescue conversations from filth, from doubt, from unbelief. It should engulf us. It should be all that we are. As salt add flavor, as flavor to foods, our speech should add flavor. Uh, the new man should add charm, uh, should add hope to conversations. We should know how to respond to each person as salt in this world. But Jesus goes on to say, but if salt has become tasteless, how can it again be, be salted? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Well, what happens when salt, this salt, uh, which is influenced by the chemicals around it, it's not like the salt we have, could be easily diluted. It could be easily changed and become useless. Well, I would suggest to you that if salt loses its saltiness, it's going to become powerless and pointless. And I believe what Jesus is saying here, that we, as temples of the Holy Spirit, as we, kingdom citizens and ambassadors for Christ, as we, or his presence on the earth as we potentially lose our saltiness, that we become powerless and pointless. Why do we exist? We are called to bring life, to bring hope again, not to be saltless, not to be ineffective. So Jesus tells his followers, you are the salt of the earth. He goes on to say in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus calls us to be light, but not just again any light in Jerusalem or in America, but we're the light of the world. One commentator says, whereas salt is hidden, light is obvious. Salt works secretly while light works openly. Salt works from within, light from without. Salt is more of an indirect influence of the gospel. The light is more of a direct communication. Salt works primarily through our living while light works primarily through what we teach and preach. We are called to, to not only be ambassadors of this light, but to, to walk in the light. I was reminded of the old Aretha Franklin song, walk in the light, beautiful light, come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus would say those words in John 8, 12, that he is indeed the light of the world. We were once in darkness, but now we have been brought into his kingdom. 
Colossians 1.13 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred into his, in the kingdom of his beloved Son. We are called to be light of the world, to be shining brightly with the gospel message, Prepare to give a gospel presentation to all who hear, all who listen. Ephesians 5 tells us what this light is to be specifically. He says these words in verse 8, Paul writes, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. The light exposes, it dispels darkness. Believers, as we shine light, we are to dispel darkness. A city, a city that's set on a hill, he gives us this metaphor. A city is not going to be hidden as it's, maybe he's picturing Jerusalem there that's high and lofty that you can see day or night. It's set on a hill so everyone can see it. Our lives are to be, in a sense, as the Christ uses us, as he, his light shines through us, we're to be like that city that others can see. Not hidden, not as this lamp. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket wouldn't make sense, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who hear. A pastor tells this story, uh, or gives this illustration, I should say, it's not a story. He says, stars show up at night, but they burn all the time. We can only see them at night when the darkness is all around. Christians are to be unhindered light in a generation that prefers darkness. In order to get us to shine, God at times will allow situations that are, that are hard, that are difficult. But by reflecting on his will and his perspective and his viewpoint, we provide light. I think it's that dark time now and for many of us in our world. For those of us in the Lehigh Valley, in Pennsylvania, throughout the East Coast, as we see this virus continuing just to take hold and grips communities. We are to be light in the midst of that. We are to provide hope in the midst of this situation. Lastly, Jesus concludes with these words in verse 16. What does it mean to walk in the light? What does it mean to be salt in the earth and light in the world? Or let your light so shine before men in such a way that they see your good works. Now we know that by following the Admonitions found in verses 3 through 12, those things aren't salvific. Um, by doing good works aren't salvific. They're not going to save us. Those things don't make us kingdom citizens. They display or prove that we're kingdom citizens. We are saved by the grace of Christ alone, by faith alone. Both those are a gift from God. So these things, these works don't save, but they display who we say we are. They will show and display that we're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. These works are to be seen by others. But they don't give us as individuals glory. They don't give our families glory. Not even our church glory. Not even the church. It gives God glory. As we continue to stand in a dark time, a difficult time, brothers and sisters, we will be what Christ has called us to be, his ambassadors True kingdom citizens, we will display those attributes here described as salt of the earth and light of the world. And we pray that those people who see us are attracted to him, are attracted to the gospel message. Martin Lloyd-Jones says these words in closing. The glory of the gospel is that when the, when the whole church is absolutely different than the world, she, the world, is inevitably attracted to it. It is this then that the world is made to listen to her message, though it may hate her at first. What's Jones, Jones talking about there? That we are called to be different. We're called to be a light, not darkness, to be a beacon. And though the world may not embrace that message initially, he believes that those who are the called, God's people, will be drawn to that light from the darkness. Maybe that describes some of us. 
How shall we now live? As we close, can I make it maybe a tad bit more personal in the question? How will you now live? Two weeks from now, a month from now, whenever the band's lifted, whenever we can interact with one another again, you go back to work, school starts again, activities continue, sports are back on television maybe for me, and everything gets back to normal. How am I going to live then? Has God so gripped my heart? He's, has he so captured my thinking? Has my, have my goals now been reassessed? Have I been refocused back on him? Is, am I going to return to that? Well, brothers and sisters, my, my prayer is that I won't, that we as a Bethel family, the outreach that we've seen, the love that we've seen communicated in both word and deed around this building has been wonderful. My prayer is that it continues. Uh, the love that I know that families have had, uh, interaction with children, maybe times of new devotional thoughts for fathers or mothers as they lead. I pray all those things will continue. I pray that we will continue to live as children of, of the King, ambassadors of His, as salt and light. And I pray that God will impress upon all of our collective hearts to truly know how we shall live in front of this world at this desperate time. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we're thankful for your holy word and your reminders that tell us who we really are. Lord, we are not, we are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of a far greater kingdom. We have been brought into that kingdom by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of being new kingdom citizens, there are things that flow from us. And the text described as being salt and light. Lord, I pray that it's our collective goal to be that salt and light. Yes, during this trying time, this difficult time, but also after this time passes, when the worries and fears go away, would we continue to look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. We promise, we promise God, uh, Lord, that we will be committed to these things. We commit our hearts to you now. I pray that that's the, the clear prayer of our heart. Lord, would we realize and know we can't do it on our own? Would you, by the power of your spirit, remind us of these things and stir us to good works? that again your name might be glorified. Father, we love you. Please teach us to love you more and our neighbor as ourselves. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.